It's capable of fast response, it's capable of response in less than a second. second Zero yeah. to 100 yeah. percent power in less than a second. Yeah, I think the batteries and the energy storage technologies of the future will be required to last longer, frankly. We use an extremely sort of dense, magna-dense material. You either need a lot of mass or you need a lot of height. If you go underground, then you're using the geology of the earth, if you like, to hold up that weight. And that's okay. and that's uh, that's the sort of the secret sauce. Hello everybody, Quentin here. Now in this episode, we're talking about the oldest technology known to man, gravity and gravity batteries. We've got Robin Lane on from Gravitricity, who have been one of the leading players in gravity energy storage pretty much since we all heard of it. And what's interesting about this conversation is the journey that Gravitricity have been on from moving magna-dense material up and down mine shafts to where they're going now and in the future is fascinating. So let's see what you think in the comments. I hope you like it. So Robin, gravity, gravity energy storage, that's what you guys do, right? Yes, it is. Gravity is, um, is always there. You can rely on it. It's not ever going to go anywhere. So it seemed to us to be a, a, a good thing to be uh, making energy storage, uh, basing energy storage on. We're actually more than that. We're a company who um, has legacy wise. It's, we have believed in, I guess, the power of underground spaces and, and the potential of underground spaces to uh, to really make a meaningful difference and offer energy storage at grid scale, which is what we need. And gravity is the kind of the first technology off the block, if you like, in that respect. Gravity is um, a technology. Love it. Yeah, a lot, a lot of ups and downs in this. There's a lot. Of, in fact, there's a there's a lot of dad jokes to be said in this episode. Yes, we'll try and, okay, we'll try and get them in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then so gravitricity. Where's gravitricity based? Gravitricity is based in Edinburgh, mm -hmm. um, and we've got a team of about 15 or 16 employees. Um, based in Edinburgh, then we've we've put together our project demonstrator um, up in Edinburgh, and that's where that has been. It's it's down now, and it, we've sort of disassembled it. But it's we did some testing on that, and and that was a massive learning experience for us. Okay, cool. Well, we're going to come back to the technology and the company mm -hmm. in a minute. But as ever, I'm going to ask you about you. Um, how are you here? How long have you been doing gravitricity, and what were you doing before that? So we've got sure. some frames of reference about your thinking. Sure. So I've been at Gravitricity for uh, about 18 months. I'm the commercial director, so I've got a broad remit across um, strategy, uh, identification and definition and delivery, as, as well as managing the commercial side, commercial relationships. Um, um, so it's a fairly broad role, and, and, and that's one of the things I love about it. Going back in time, so I've been in the, I guess, the nexus between um, uh, the entrepreneurial journey and CSR and, and sustainability and the, and the low carbon agenda for about, uh, I guess, uh, 15 or 16 years. So going back to, say, 2006, very different world back then. Um, this is pre uh, Nick Stern, the Stern Review, pre Inconvenient Truth, when a rock was something that you picked up off the ground um, mm -hmm. and, and nothing else. And um, the, the, yeah, the, the space was just starting to gather some momentum, I guess. And fast forward to, um, you know, 2010, 2012, there was much more work around working for energy retailers, food retailers who, who were a kind of early adopter to, to the sector, um, as well as the Carbon Trust and, and government, both central and local. So there was a lot of work to be done there, um, helping those organizations really identify and crystallize and realize the opportunities uh, which were presented, the business opportunities which were presented by I guess the low carbon agenda. So were you a consultant during that period? Or yeah, I was. I was I was a consultant uh, working with those companies and then I worked in house for a large corporate um, identifying and 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 developing businesses in a particular area of the agenda. Which, then which I, large corporate? You, so yeah. I was I was I was at Arkiva for okay. um for for 2 years between 2012 and 2014. They are sensibly a, a comms organization but they 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 saw a massive opportunity for them in smart metering. And and so I was brought on board as a as a sort of a, I guess a flexibility and, and smart metering specialist to to help them identify and, and and track down what exactly that meant for them, um, and then more recently I've worked directly with technology companies. I've always had a conviction that technology companies and and technology has to be a really really big part of the the overall solution to to, de to decarbonisation and. 
you know, so I worked directly with uh, technology companies, spin outs from universities, Fred's, Fred in a Shed kind of organizations, uh, and many other different profiles directly through government grants, um, helping them to identify their strategy, helping them to negotiate agreements uh, and pre- prepare for investor raising as well. Okay. Um, I should say that before that, I was a corporate lawyer. So I was a corporate lawyer for about um, six or seven years, um, both in the city of London and in Brussels and in Sydney, training there, doing um, corporate and commercial M&A type transactions. So that's uh, that's how I began my career. It's been a good grounding, but I had a I had a conviction that there must be more to life. And uh, as it turned out, I was right. OK, cool. And then so we're going to go into detail about the technology in a minute. But yeah. so Grabatricity, this is a company based in Scotland. And you guys, well, what's, what's, what's the belief? Because we're lithium people, really. Mm. Right? Most of our customers and the industry is all about lithium ion batteries. And then there's a few, few bits on the periphery, like flow batteries and flywheels and gravity batteries and all these things. So what's the, what's the gravity play? What do you guys believe about the market or about the technology that means that this, is, this business makes sense? Yeah, yeah. It's a really good question, and I, and I think I think the foundation belief is that the 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 landscape of energy storage, which we've seen develop over the last five or seven years, because it's grown up extraordinarily quickly, um, really come from nowhere since 2014-15. Um, that that is fantastic story, and 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 we as in the UK should be proud of, I guess, being at the leading edge of that internationally. And lithium ion has played a obviously an important role, and it will continue to play an important role. But but I think the the, the future of energy storage is somewhat different. I, I think the reason why lithium ion has played that role is that it was an off the shelf, mature, ready to go technology, which was, as I say, ready to go to scale up. Um, and uh, able to deliver on those needs as as and when they were there, I don't think that that's necessarily going to be the case. I think the I think the use case and and the demand requirement from the market has been relatively homogenous over the last five seven years, and I don't see that continuing into the future. What, what does that mean, homogenous? <laughs> it means that it's In the same. It, it means that it means that the the single use case for for grid scale energy storage over that time period has been. Um, fast duration, um, uh, sorry, sorry, long duration, also short duration, high power kind of services. Mm-hmm. And um, that's the kind of use case that lithium ion has fitted well into. And that will, that will continue. Uh, but I think that um, the energy storage landscape will kind of fan out and diversify. And I think there are a number of different dimensions on which the markets will um, be requiring more and, and different capabilities of energy storage technologies than they have in the past. Okay, so what's what's the play for the gravity? Do you call it the gravity battery, or the gravity technology, or, or um, what, what, gravity what? gravity based energy storage? Gravity is what based we normally energy. we can call it a gravity battery, but most people regard a battery as a chemical battery, and that can kind of confuse matters. Okay, so yeah. what's the what's the play here? So if lithium ion batteries are doing their bit on the grid, and there's you know, there's, there's, there's billions of pounds of capex being deployed into that sector right now. Mm. But there are some things that lithium ion isn't, uh, you know, um, there are sort of some shortcomings, especially with longer duration mm. um, and number of cycles. Um, although both of those lithium ion folks pretty much think they've solved to a certain degree. Um, what What's the gravity play here? What's, what's, the, what's the secret source yeah. about the gravity, ba- I'm going to call it the gravity battery because I can't yeah. remember the, the next bit. Um, yeah, well, what's all that about? Yeah. So to just elaborate on, on what I said before, I, I think the, the there are at least three ways in which the capability requirements of the future market will fan out and, and sort of diversify. And, and the first of those is in terms of longevity. I think the batteries and the energy storage technologies of the future will be required to last longer, frankly, than they. And, and the reason for that is they're going to be seen as a grid infrastructure asset. And they, they will therefore have to, I guess, perform the role and have a, a lifetime to match other grid infrastructure assets. So so that I, I see as a really important part of so the So you future. mean decades and decades rather yeah. than a single decade like that? Exactly are, right. Exactly right. And, and I th- the second way is is that they will need to be uh, capable of being more aggressively cycled. So we're talking about not just necessarily one cycle every day, but um, potentially charging and discharging and charging again and then discharging again a little, little bit and then all the way and then all, all the way up to the top. 
potentially multiple times every day. And again, if you if you expose a lithium ion battery to that, it, it's not going to last particularly long. And and the third way is is long duration, longer duration systems. And and I, so those are the three ways I think that the capability requirements of the future are not necessarily going to match up to the ones of the past. Um, so to get back to to our system and and why we think it plays a part. Well, um, on on the uh, on the no longevity front, we have got a system which we believe can last for many many decades. Um, there's no system or or component part which can't be switched out and, and change and obviously we've got operation and maintenance costs but they're not huge um, and they will go down over time as well so so it's a it's a system that can last for many decades it's it's got that high power um, short duration type capabilities it's capable of fast response it's capable of response in less the second and less than a second so it can, can compete in those markets um, is that full power in less than a second or yeah, it starts it's, moving yeah, in yeah yeah no it's full power in less than so a second zero yeah. to 100 yeah. percent power in less than a second yeah. okay and that's something which we've validated through our, our concept demonstrator okay um yeah so there's that and and so there's the there's the longevity of the system there's the the low opex cost there's a, a um no depth of discharge limits. Um, it's the safety requirements, and and those are the things that we think we can bring to the party, which are, are fundamentally very different <clears throat> to. Um, but I guess there is a depth. Line. There's a depth of shaft limit, right? Which is uh, which is the kind of the depth of dis discharge limit. So the there there are there is a low and upper bounds on the the energy that can go into these things uh, and be stored in these things mechanically, in the same way that there's a chemical low and upper bounds within a. Lithium ion cell. Yeah, so it's, I, I guess what I meant there is that you can drop the weight all the way down to the bottom of the shaft. The, mm -hmm. the shaft is always going to have a bottom, and if it doesn't have a bottom which we're using, um, the, the the limitation will be the length of the cables yeah. you use. And so, so for I mean, a shaft without a, a bottom of the bottom is good. <laughs> but that, that's my mind blown. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess every every shaft will have a bottom, but it's a question of whether we want to go all the way to the bottom, and it yeah. may be that we don't, or, or we, uh, you know. Some shafts aren't exactly sort of straight. They sort of curve in at, um, as they well, get deeper. And, and so that there'll come a time when you drop the weight and it will get stuck halfway down. So you don't want to do that. So, so let's be clear here, because there's a few different gravity technologies out there or ideas. So um, if I've got this right, you guys are doing stuff vertically up and down, like mm. a bit like a lift, mm. right? But with a big weight in it, Pretty rather much. than something on wheels going down a mine shaft or going down, uh, going down a hill, if you like, underground. Yep. Yep. You guys are going up and down, up and down mm -hmm. that way. If you're, we're getting into technology now, but if you're, um, if, if you've got a, how deep do these things have to go and how much weight do you have to move to get an equivalent amount of Yeah, yeah. Energy? So that's an interesting question. So very, very simple formula that governs the amount of electricity that we can store in a particular shaft. And uh, the formula is M MGH, so energy is given by yeah. it's, it's, it's GCSE mass. physics. Exactly. So yeah. it's, it's really, really basic stuff. Mass so times it's a, gravity it's a function. Times height. Exactly. It's those three things. Going back to the beginning, gravity is your constant. Obviously, there's 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 no way in which you can change that. Ten ish. Not an yeah, ten ish, just just below ten. Um, and so they feel you've got mass and height as your two variables you've got to play with. And what that means is that you need heavy 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 weights. Um, and you need long drops in order to make gravity energy storage work. And when I say heavy weights, I, I don't mean sort of a few tens of tons. Um, you need to be talking about weights in the hundreds of tons to oh, really, hundreds of tons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To make this wow. really, really work. And that's perfectly doable. Um, you know, we're going to be lifting up weights of, say, 500 tons or more at a time um, and, and dropping them through a drop of, say, um, you know, m m multiple hundreds of meters, so 500 meters or plus. And and if you Jeez. do that, you can you can generate and store a very interesting amount of electricity. So what does that look like? Let's do, so say you've got um, five hundred tons. I don't even know what five hundred tons. Five hundred. What does a mini weigh? A mini is like half a ton, right? That's not the yeah. right one. Five. What does a car weigh? About? Yeah, I mean a car. I mean a, a big car, a big SUV might weigh sort of two or three tons, I guess. Okay, so it's yeah. so we're talking so two hundred and fifty cars. Yeah, we're going to lift them all up at once. Yeah. We'll put them down, and then we put them. Down, how big is this thing? You know, how, how much space does it take up? Yeah, so so the diameter of the, the shaft is is likely to be six or seven meters uh, standard. I mean, if we're deploying in shafts that already exist, we we obviously take on the diameters that are already there. Like uh, a mine when shaft. We're, exactly, like a yeah. mine shaft. If you're dealing with shafts that um, um, well don't exist and we're digging them from scratch, we can obviously customize that and choose yeah. what diameter we want. But so so the parameters, the, the weight are obviously governed by the, the parameters of the shaft and you've got six meters, but and it, it'll be quite multiple meters deep in 
in order to get to that 500 meters. We use an extremely sort of dense, magna-dense kind of uh, material. We hold it in a bucket and we and we fill it to the top. And you can get yeah, that's, that's a new right. word. So, yeah, it's 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 a it's a fairly commonly used sort of ballast in in heavy okay. industrial. Um, uh, applications uh, sourceable around the world. You don't want to be moving 500 ton weights around the place. So, so, so yeah. what, what about numbers? So, look, um, like megawatt hour terms. Let's get a frame of reference here. So, a um, let's say a, a ton going up and down in a shaft that goes 100 meters. I don't know. We could, we could do the maths live on air. You might have some of these to your... So what, what, what are some examples? So a ton isn't going to get you much. A ton's um, not going to get you so, much. So if we go to 500 tons, 500 which is tons, kind yeah. of the metric we tend to use, if you drop 500 tons through a, a distance of roughly about 600 metres, you get a megawatt hour um, wow. of electricity. So, so you, going back to what I said, you do need heavy weights and you do need long drops, which is why, incidentally, we believe that the only way to do gravity energy storage is... Uh, below ground um, and we've got competitor technologies who are looking to do things above ground we don't believe at gravitricity that that is the right way to be going about it because um, if you're talking about weights in the 500 ton sort of realm you can't pick those weights up and lift them above ground uh, unless you've got an incredibly strong structure which would prove prohibitively expensive if you go underground then you're using the geology of the earth if you like to hold up that weight and that's okay. and that's uh, that's the sort of the secret source. It seems like a lot of weight to move, a long, long way for yeah. one megawatt hour, right? Considering a one, I'm just thinking about comparison, one megawatt hour of um, I know it's different cycling and things in a lithium ion battery. That's about half a half ship, ship um, half a shipping container, so mm. twenty foot shipping container, and that will probably cost capex wise, let's say installed, you know. 400 grand, so 400,000 pounds installed, maybe a little bit more. Um, in fact, it's changing on a daily basis. So, and then what does the capex cost of one of these? I guess you have to amortize it over a longer period, right? Because it's yeah. a longer, it, it lasts for longer. But let's, yeah. let's um, what, what, what do you spend on a 600 meter shaft with a 500 ton yeah. magna weight in it? Yeah. So. So if you're asking it, if we're competitive today with lithium ion, the answer is no. But mm -hmm. I also think that's the wrong question to ask because you're comparing a mature technology which has gone down that cost curve with a technology which is um, still traveling down that cost journey and is frankly quite near the beginning of it. Yep. Um, and if you, look at, if you look at other industries, I mean, um, I was looking at this recently, uh, the offshore wind industry between 2010 and 2020 uh, came down the, the levelized cost of energy of that uh, of offshore wind came down 70%. Now that's a, that's an achievement that no one could possibly have predicted in the in the noughties and, and leading up to 2020 and, and and there are all sorts of naysayers who are saying that it's going to stay really really expensive and uncompetitive and how have we achieved that we've achieved it through um, efficient supply chains uh, better technology um, and and frankly also uh, well economies of scale but also very, very strong policy commitment from, from government through ROCs, through um, CFDs more recently. And, and that's, that's what's been achieved and those costs continue to come down. So, so I would say that, um, as I say, we're, we're at the start of that journey and we believe that we've got an enormous cost reduction. So, so our analysis shows that we can reduce our costs by uh, well over 50%. Um, okay. over time and and we believe that we can become cost competitive with lithium ion um in time okay interesting so that that's the core thesis here right otherwise no one would, would be doing the work absolutely because so the so the argument is the cost of this of gravity storage will become competitive with competitive with lithium ion mm. at some point in the future yeah. if we keep working on it um, what about this? There's a few different gravity companies out there, gravity, gravity companies, selling gravity, um, uh, put, uh, developing gravity energy storage solutions. Mm. And they're all very, very different. Mm. Where do you guys fit into the overall realm of this new technology? Yeah, we talk about our gravity systems being able to offer. Um, so we've got a single weight system. So that's what it says it is. It's 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 dropping a single weight up and down a shaft, and that is very much kind of aligned with the current lithium market and where the current lithium uh, batteries uh, offer themselves into the market. So so short duration, high power type applications, frequency regulation, ancillary services. That's where they play, and that's where the single weight system uh, will in time play. We've also got a multi-weight system, 
um, which does what it says on the tin. It, it, it picks up a weight, it, it drops it down to the ground. And as that's, that weight is decelerating towards the bottom of the shaft, the mechanism at the top is picking up a different weight and, and repeating that process. And, and you can potentially you can do that multiple times, thereby offering um, you know, multiple hours of, of, of duration capability. So you go kind of up, down, up, down with two arms to this thing, if you like. Or is it all on one continuous? Cable? Yeah, no. So, so the weights get stacked on top of each other. Um, so you've got a you've got a sort of a, a sort of a in time you've got a, a sort of quite a few weights stacked on top of each other. And and obviously the second weight can't travel the same distance as the first weight because the second weight goes on top of the first weight and so uh, on. So, but if you've got a deep enough shaft, you can actually do that quite a few times before the limitation of the shaft depth becomes an issue. Okay, so you guys have got you got a single weight and multi weight, yeah. and you go up and down in shafts. And are you aiming for existing shafts or new shafts? We had a um, someone on from Fitna Consulting Engineers uh, recently talking about energy from waste, fascinating thing in itself. And one of the things he said on the podcast, which really made me think, was that going into the ground costs 10 times more than going up. Right? That's what, that was his sort of rule of thumb. Because going, you don't know what's in the ground and you might, you know, there's, there's different rock formations and it's just expensive going into the ground. Mm. So um, do you guys, is that driving you guys to look at existing mine shafts around the place or are you going to be digging new holes or shafts? What did he mean by going up? Do you mean, mean going above Structurally ground? Structurally going up. I guess you're talking about yeah, different yeah. weights though, right? I, I I would like to. Um, uh, I'd like to speak to this guy. I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know who he is, but please put me in touch because we don't believe it's credible to go above ground. For basically, for the reasons we've we've already talked about. So you need to be talking about weights in multiple t uh, hundreds of tons, yeah. and you need to be dropping those weights through con significant distances. And once you realise those two things, those once you have those two insights to hand, you do the maths on lifting up 500 tons above ground. You can't do it unless you're spending multiple, multiple millions of pounds on an incredibly strong structure. Um, and that's gonna blow your business case out of the water. Whereas if you're going below ground, in multiple cases, you've actually got the hole already. Um, and you're utilizing, I guess, the, the old, the infrastructure of the old energy system to, to enable the new. And there's a, there's a really good story there about how we're sort of reutilizing, repurposing old coal mines. Um, but but it, oh, yeah, it, it, it allows us to do that for free and, and it allows us to be talking about weights um, of a different order of magnitude. Interesting. So um, let's go back to those, what, what these shafts that are already existing out there. Mm. Are these coal mines or are these other types of mines? Yeah, they're, they're most obviously coal mines. And, and, and one of the reasons they're coal mines is because, I mean, obviously it plays to the, the good story about <clears throat> the decarbonisation agenda and how we're sort of using the old system. But also there are a lot of coal mines which are going out of commission right now all the way around the world. Um, they're, I mean, they're tens of thousands of good. mind. Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> good, just good, good, good riddance. Very good. Um, and so, that, I mean, I was reading a report that was saying that 50,000 coal mines, uh, sorry, mines in Australia alone, which wow. um, are just waiting to have something done with them. Eastern Europe is a, is a hot spot for these, for these mines. A lot of people are wondering how to wean themselves off coal in Eastern Europe, Poland, the Czech Republic, those kind of countries. The move away from coal is very much of a... A sort of a, an active gender. The, the UK has kind of traveled that journey already. And, and so a lot of our old coal mines, our legacy coal mines have been filled in or otherwise decommissioned. So, so, so that's less of an option, I think, on the, on the coal mining front. Although, you know, it doesn't need to be a coal mine. It can be a tin mine. It can be a platinum mine. There are plenty of them in South Africa. Um, and we see South Africa is an interesting market. Interesting. Let's come back to the, the, the technology itself. So if I got this right, if it's like a, it's a bit like a crane. Um, or is it with a with a generator on? Is that is that any is that is that true? Yeah, it is. It's it's um the, so, so you're using you're using uh, heavy lift equipment which is actually on the ground, um, and that heavy lift equipment doubles as a generator as well. So in one in one direction it's heavy lift equipment winching the the system up to the top, the motor the going to the top, yeah. exactly, and then. Once the weight is going down, playing down towards the bottom, you know, it's 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 doubling as a generator and it's pulling the cable through, uh, making that electricity. There's lots of clever gearing in the generator to make sure that actually, although we're dropping the weight quite slowly, slowly, the the generator is going fast and, and uh, generating all we can. There's something about this which is very. It feels it's simple, right? It's mechanical. It's almost primitive in thinking mm. about storing. I'm sure. 
the Aztecs or someone in history has done this kind of thing before, storing stuff up a hill or up at the top of a shaft. Um, and it's very simple to explain and think about. Um, how, w w what's the vision here? What's the, what's the, what, if gravi gravity energy storage takes off, what does success look like? So to go back to your first point, it, I mean, it is gravity energy storage was the first form of energy storage. We've had we've had um, pumped hydro uh, uh, pumped hydro energy storage for multiple decades, and then you know even before that we got grandfather clocks. I don't know what the legacy of grandfather clocks and how far we go back in time for them, but many hundreds of years. You're not going to give me the Aztecs, though, are you? <laughs> uh, look, I don't know about the Aztecs. I wouldn't like to say for sure. I'm sure somebody watching this will know about the Aztecs. The only thing I know about the Aztecs is they ate a lot of flax seeds. My wife tells me that, and that, that's what, for some reason, made, made them way healthier than we are. But okay, okay. so, um, but yeah. So but look, it's, it's an old system. There's it's no an doubt old, old that. system, And, and, yeah. and um, we're just sort of... Um, we're doing things in a slightly different way, but the technologies we're using are fairly tried and tested. Um, and the clever stuff we're doing is in the integration. The way we're bringing those technologies together um, is is genuinely innovative and, and novel and different. Um, to get back to your point about what does what does success look like? What does good look like? Um, so, so we see a world of distributed energy storage. We're not going to get um, the, the distributed or the energy storage of the future is going to be in multiple, multiple locations. Um, and so we've got a system, we've got to have a system which is um, capable of being distributed around different points of the grid, um, serving those different applications, some behind the meter applications, um, offering those grid services in energy access kind of uh, roles um, in the developing world in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, uh, India and the subcontinent of, of Asia. Um, so, so we see gravity energy storage playing a really, really important part in, in delivering energy and enabling the low carbon transition around the world. But alongside other storage technologies or is it going to... Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. I think I, I, the way I see it, energy storage um, will diversify. It will inevitably diversify. So you've got you've got lithium at the moment. You've got pumped hydro. I think the the, the technologies of the future will include gravity. I think they will also include thermal uh, energy storage technologies, um, and I think there'll be others as well. Um, you know, there are great many ways in which you can store heat for the production of energy. Um, to me, the only thing that matters is cost, right? The, uh, the, like, above all else, the thing that matters is cost, because mm. it's going to be economics will win in the end. Mm. And I look at something like the Norwig, right, which is the, the yep. battery of the West, yep. uh, 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 Wales' battery, uh, the UK's battery. Fascinating, multi-decade long structure that essentially has been supporting keeping the lights on for, for a long, long time, longer mm. than I've been around. Mm. And I look at that and the scale of it, Mm. And um, someone will tell me I'm wrong here, but it's a couple of gigawatts, right? Something like that across a few units, maybe even bigger. And the amount of water that that thing needs to hold and move between those two reservoirs is just, if you, if you go and you see it, it just blows your mind. You know, it's mm. incredible. And so now then I think about other energy storage technologies. And, and as you say, for, for moving mass around, you either need a lot of mass or you need a lot of height. And so the question to me is, can we get those two things to the scale we need with gravity energy storage without moving, p pumping a material around like water, with it being physical on, on a cable, I assume it is? Yeah. That's so, a big challenge. Look, pump, hump, Pumped Hydro has done a, a great job, and in Orwig and Ben Kraken and, and the others um, play a really, really important part of the, um, the energy grid, or deliver really, really important services to the energy grid um, in this country at the moment. And as you say, they have done for many years. But I don't see them playing a really important part, or technologies like them, in enabling future renewable penetration, because they're there already, and frankly, we're site limited. With there are not many places in the UK where you can, uh, where there's sufficient level of drop, mountains, um, water receptacles, and, and what have you, to, to to install a great many more of these things. Um, whereas gravity, the kind of gravity energy storage that we're talking about, doesn't have that uh, fle uh, that location or I guess limitation. It can be it can be located anywhere, and that's one of the key advantages. But the fundamentally, the physics is the same. And so um, how many of these mine shafts are there around the UK? Say we wanted to put a gravity energy storage uh, system in all the sort of megawatt 
our style uh, size mine shafts in the yeah. UK. So yeah. 500 tons going down 600 meters. Yeah. How many of those are there for us to tap into? So look, in, in the UK, as I said, the UK is not a great market for coal mines because um, they're, they're, most of them have been filled in and, and, uh, and sort of repurposed in other ways at the moment. Um, that could change in the future. And, and we, we don't, we're not limited to, to the coal mines and, and the mines that already exist. We, we absolutely see a future where you would be digging your own mines as well, creating your own shafts and deploying these systems in those shafts. And, and then you've got, obviously, you've got a, you've got a challenge around the business case um, because sinking those kind of shafts in the ground isn't exactly cheap. And, and that's where our other deployments and other technologies come in because we've already all, always had a conviction at Gravitricity that um, we see gravity as a way in which you can utilize underground spaces for energy storage, but it's not the only one. And so you can store fuel gases um, in these spaces. Uh, you can use it for compressed air and you can generate and you can you can store interseasonal heat potentially down, down, down there as well. Just before we come on to the other use cases, so something's just occurred to me and um, I might be wrong, but you said digging new shafts is expensive. Oh, it's, it's, it's not cheap. Interested to know what not cheap means. I've got no idea what it costs to, bigger shaft, to dig a shaft. Actually, from a technology perspective, digging shafts is not a new technology, right? So you'd think that the cost curve has already come down on the shaft digging. Shaft, is digging the right term? I don't know. Shaft creating. Sinking. Sinking, sinking mm. yeah. Um, and so what does it cost to, to create a new shaft? Well, look, it, it depends. Um, it's a frustrating answer, but it does so much depend on the kind of geological formations you're, you're digging into, um, you're sinking into. Um, and, and, and so it's hard to give a direct answer to that, but we're, we're at the forefront of, of that. We're at the forefront of bringing those, those costs down. To, to, your, to your point about whether that journey has been traveled when it comes to sinking shafts, I don't actually think it has because mining has historically been an extremely profitable industry. Um, and not one when they've necessarily had to focus relentlessly on on cost and cost down and how can we squeeze out the cost and how can we do better um, because they've known that once you get there um, plus plus the fact that energy has always already been an imperative so if you if if we need coal and we've always needed coal historically you need to do the digging right so it doesn't really matter what it costs so 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 there's that and 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 so I think. Um, it, it very much depends, very much depends on that. But, but there's also the, the fact that mine, the mine is a place of work, right? So, and so there are all sorts of costs which relate to the <coughs> fact that people, human beings, how, are working there, yes, um, yeah. which of course wouldn't apply to, to this particular use case. So, so there are absolutely opportunities to take cost out of, of um, if you were to ask a miner or a, a shaft sinking company, how much does it cost to sink a mine for the purposes of coal digging? Um, that wouldn't necessarily be a good guide to to what we're looking at. Okay, just to move a way up and down. Yeah. Um, and then what about these other use cases? Actually, before we get there, I'm jumping around. Grab a, let's go back mm -hmm. to the company. So who what, who founded the company and how long has it been going and how is it funded? Who, who are the backers and um, what next? Yeah, okay. So um, the, the company was uh, founded in, I think, 2012 or so, and, and it was founded by mm -hmm. Martin Wright and, and Peter Frankel uh, originally, um, and they have a, 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 a sort of a long history of working with each other um, on uh, energy storage technologies and, and renewable low carbon energy storage or energy generating technologies as well. Um, Peter's more, he's the sort of the, the mad scientist, he's the engineer who thinks outside the box and Martin's more of the, the businessman type and they work extremely well together. Um, so, so a few patents were fi filed, and and uh, and we've got those patents now in the bag. Um, the the company really started to gather pace when we got Charlie Bellet on board, and he joined, I think, in 2017. Uh, he's really pushed the company forward, um, recruited all the people we've got now, and uh, and sort of been the sort of the the driving the driving charge. Um, of the company, and and so that's that's where it pre uh, goes back to. Um, but really, in the last, I would say, two to three years, is we've really, really sort of gathered momentum and gathered pace. Um, we've raised about eight million pounds in funding through a combination wow. of um, founders' equity, high net worths, crowd raises, and R and D funding. Cool. 
Wow, I, and what does it cost? You've already done some, some. I saw you at a trial one in Edinburgh, mm. um, and was that 250 kilowatts? Or yeah, that's that? right. So fairly fairly humble in terms of um, the, the output and the duration, uh, but that wasn't really the point. It wasn't yeah. about um, making money or, or even demonstrating that it could make money. It was, it was more about uh, validating the technical performance okay. of the technology. So, so there are a few really important things that came out of that. Um, firstly, that we could respond in less than a second, which is really, really important for eligibility for those high power, short duration type services. Um, that we had a really um, competitive round trip efficiency. So it's sort of nudging right. up towards 80%. Um, and 80%. and we think we think we can improve on that in a full scale system, but it's sort of um, up to eighty percent is is where we got to on the concept demo, um, and then our standstill losses were pretty pretty negligible. So in other words, that weight can 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 sit there at the top of the top of the drop for as long as you want it to, um, pending the right sort of market signals for it to to be let go. Okay, cool. And then your so you raised eight million pounds. Did you have to spend a lot of that on the the um, tr- because these are capital intensive things. Yeah. Did, you have, did you have to spend a lot of that on getting your your first projects off the ground or um, was that funded by R&D? Yeah, stuff? so, so that, the, the concept demo that I've just been talking about was funded through Innovate okay. UK um, and uh, t- to the tune of, you know, 60 or so, so percent. So we, we had to provide the match funding and, and that's part of the course in these kind of instances. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, so, so absolutely, that was, that's part of that eight million pounds that we just talked about. And um, other than that, it's been uh, operational expenses, taking the technology for- forward, um, developing the feed, um, front end engineering design kind of work, uh, the detailed design, delivering projects um, on a consultancy basis. So these are the kind of things that cool. we've, we've worked a lot on. And um, so you guys had a big announcement recently. Do you wanna talk about that for a moment? Yeah, so so we're we're pushing to the forefront the the, the second way in which um, um, we believe uh, underground spaces can be used for the purposes of energy storage, and and that's to store fuel gases, and in particular to store hydrogen. Um, we see hydrogen as a, a massive part of the energy transition, and and a really important part of of that agenda. Um, You've, um, I know you've talked a lot to different people and different uh, episodes of this podcast about hydrogen, so we won't talk about it so much, but, but obviously our take on it is on the storage side and, and, and other people will have their own view on different parts. But, but on the energy storage side, we see hydrogen storage as being a really important part of the hydrogen economy um, because um, if you're generating green hydrogen, you need somewhere to put it because the production is intermittent. And isn't, so you need somewhere to put it. Isn't hydrogen, isn't the thing about hydrogen, uh, apologies, I'm uh, very basic thinking on this. Isn't the thing, one of the things about hydrogen is it takes up a lot of space, right? Um, and so it takes up a lot, lot more space than methane for the same amount mm-hmm. of energy. And uh, generally, volumetrically, it is a big thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so for a shaft, I'm just thinking like a 600 meter shaft with, are these going to be bigger shafts? A 600 meter shaft with a, nine meter diameter um i don't know how much hydrogen can you store in one of those yeah so you need a bloody big shaft yeah so so we wouldn't actually be using those kind of shafts we'd be using purpose-built shafts um but we can we can store about 100 tons worth of hydrogen in in the shafts that we're talking about and we believe and, and this is i guess crucial to our proposition in the market we we believe that that actually is the right level of hydrogen um, to store for, for the, the kind of use cases that are going to really start gathering pace. We don't see hydrogen necessarily being used in all these different applications. Um, very controversial topic where hydrogen will be used, where it is. Which, one, which ones are you guys focused on? So yeah, so, so we're focused on the industrial applications. We see hydrogen being used in those kind of applications where electrification is either challenging or fairly impossible. Um, so those those industrial uses where um, you need very, very high grade heat. And frankly, hydrogen is the only game in town in terms of a low carbon option. So steel making, oil refining to some extent, uh, ceramics, glass, potentially uh, large scale transportation, um, as well as long duration energy storage. So interseasonal uh, storage of hydrogen for filling in those, those uh, still uh, cold but not very sunny uh, winter days as well. So, so, so we see most of the hydrogen which is going to be produced in the hydrogen economy. It's going to be 
produced and stored and then used in fairly pr close proximity to each other, which places an emphasis less on the transportation of it and more on the, on the storage of it. And, and so we see the storage element as a really, really critical part. Um, again, you've got these two incumbent solutions. At the moment, you've got salt caverns, um, which are very geographically constrained. I think in the UK, there are only two areas where the, the geological conditions are right for salt caverns, and they're sort of Cheshire and, and East Yorkshire. So they're not really the answer, I think, for for the kind of hydrogen storage that we need. Uh, and then on the other side, you've got the you've got the above ground systems, which can store hydrogen, but they're extremely expensive. They take up space um, above ground, and they're of que questionable health and safety um, sort so of is, status. Is, is the play here that by storing hydrogen in a shaft, it's cheaper than above ground? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it'll be. I think it'll be in time. It'll be both cheaper and more attractive in other ways. Um, because it's not taking up valuable space um, and and it's safer. Okay, interesting. I want to ask you the two final questions. So firstly, is there anything you want to plug? I mean, you've just talked about your press release. I gave you that one. But is there anything else that yeah. you guys want to plug? Yeah. And then the second more interesting one, in my view, of course, is what do you believe or what does the company believe that no, that, that's good? That's, Contrarian that perhaps not a lot of other people believe, and as a when you're when you're growing a car, a company, especially a startup, you have to have some beliefs that other people will think of wacky. Yeah. So um, let's do the first one. Anything you want to plug, and yeah. then that one. Yeah. So so on the plugging side, so we're we're currently uh, involved in a, a fairly significant fundraise for the company. So we're we're going out to raise um, <laughs> roughly forty million pounds, an institutional raise. Wow. So it's a, a significant amount of money, um, and that fundraise will support and develop. Um, or enable rather um, our our um, our next three R and D projects, which are sort of on on the on the roadmap. Um, so two on the gravity side, one on the hydrogen side, and we see that as a really really critical part of our development process. And so so yeah, so so we're involved in that at the moment. We're sort of in the early stages of talking to uh, potential investors. We're looking for strategic corporates um, and and impact investors and, and, and any investors who really, really see that not only that they they, they get the play of, of gravity energy storage, but also think that they can work with us and help us pull the technology into the market. That's what we're really, really looking for. Okay. Plenty of investors listening, so uh, yep. get in touch. And then the second one, what do you what do you believe that a lot of people think you're crazy for believing? Yeah, so I I think on that I I would say that um, the the energy industry and uh, I think it looks at the future and it and it regards the future as probably being um, more of the past, and so they look at um, how we're going to carry on decarbonizing the electricity supply and and particularly respond to uh, the decarbonization of heat and transport which we all know is sort of happening already um and think oh we, we're going to need more solar and we're going to need more wind and we're going to need more lithium-ion batteries and and um yeah, and, well, and I'm, I'm certainly in that camp yeah, yeah okay. well okay well let me sort of slightly push back on that so so we we'll definitely need more wind and more solar and 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 to a certain extent we'll need more lithium as well but i i think the 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 future isn't always or the, or the past isn't necessarily a good guide to the future. And and what I would say is I think the next stage, the next sort of phase of that decarbonization journey will involve other things as well. Um, so I think I think there'll be a much more realization in the UK of the incredible potential of smart meters mm -hmm. um, and and the way in which they offer um, uh, engagement at a customer level um, and the time of use tariffs that they they potentially offer. Um, I don't think, you know, 10 years, 15 years ago, I think we would have been a bit disappointed to know that we we really haven't got going on that yet. And I and I think there's a lot more we can do on that to, to really get engaged consumers. But I'd say on the energy storage side, I think um, I, I, th I think there will be a plethora of different technologies coming to market. I don't see lithium ion delivering on all the capabilities that the market will, will require for some of the reasons we've we've talked about and so I think I think the the energy storage landscape of the future it will be of course it will be lithium but it will also be mechanical and gravity and and compressed air and it will also be uh, thermal energy storage so so we, we we don't think we can deliver on all those different market requirements but we certainly think we can deliver on some of them so um, that's how we see ourselves fitting in this is the wonderful thing about this industry which is that it's so early and nobody knows um, and there's going to be some winners and some losers. And I, 
yeah, the things that will win in the end, in my view, are cost. Cost. What was it? I um, can't remember who said it. I think it was on this podcast. Um, there's only three that three things that matter: cost, cost, and cost. And uh, it, it's true. So, um, fingers crossed, we can get the cost down on gravity energy storage, and also on digging very deep holes. <laughs> I still can't imagine how long it takes to drop a penny from. We can do the maths. Drop a penny from the top of a 600 meter shaft, and it gets to the bottom. Um, that's a little brain teaser. We'll, for we'll do the calculation and put it in the show notes. Put it in the show notes. <laughs> All right. Thanks everybody for listening, and thanks for for coming on. It's been uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Quentin. It's good to be here.